here we are officially live with y'all. <laughs> awesome. This is great. Um, I, I'm not sure if we'll just let folks um, come in or we just keep, we just start or, um, but here we are, I guess we'll, yep. Yeah, I guess we'll just, we'll just roll in. We'll just go. <laughs> Um, so, so give, give me one second, Joe. I got like an error message from Facebook. I'm sorry. Remove this destination and then re-add it. Let me remove this and re-add it. Sorry. Give me one second. I don't know what happened. All right. All right. There we go. We're all live on all streaming platforms and I'm going to go on mute and let y'all do your thing. Thank you, y'all. Right on. Thanks, live. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> awesome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the, um, the second, I believe, um, live virtual, <laughs> virtual of I'm sorry, y'all, I'm getting a little bit of a delay here on my end. Anybody sorry about that. Me. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a delay on mic, so I was getting everyone five seconds ahead. Apologize, everyone. Um, <laughs> welcome back to the second um, live virtual uh, panel for Crafted for Action. I am Stephanie Gravelisi. I am a writer in the food and beverage space, also covering craft beer, non-alcoholic beverages. And today we are talking about fun and fermentation. We're going beyond beer. We are looking at the world of fermentation and exploring alternatives to craft beer. Um, you know, from non-alcoholic beers to kombucha, you know, and everything in between. We're going to learn a little bit more about this growing segment and talk to some really cool folks doing some really great work in this space. Um, and so, Melanie, I'd love to introduce you, or I'd love to throw it to you and introduce yourself to the, to, um, for our panel. And um, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Hey, y'all. My name is Melanie Stiles. I am the founder and owner of Cultured South Fermentation Company. You might know us. We are the brewers and makers of Golda Kombucha, Georgia's first kombucha company. And I am here with my brewer, Sam. She's our head brewer. Hey, I guess that puts it on to me. Uh, yeah. So I'm Sam the head brewer of Golda Kombucha. Uh, I've been with the company for a couple of years, been home brewing for a good 10 to 15 years and I'm looking forward to getting down to some kombucha ideas today. Uh, I haven't a clue who Sally is. Hi, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Sam. Way to throw it over, like Brady Bunch style, right? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Sally Selwan. I am the regional Midwest sales manager for Athletic Brewing Company. So actually beer, just... Uh, Delicious craft beer that happens to be non-alcoholic. Great. Well, thank y'all for being here. Excited for the conversation. So to start with the idea of fermentation, it's not new. It was before beer. You know, this is fermentation is not a new concept, obviously. And even um, whether it be kombucha or non-alcoholic beer are not new areas. So um, either Melanie or Sam, would you mind just, um, just talking a little bit about where does a what is kombucha because there may be some folks who maybe not never that will be introducing them to this delicious mm -hmm. beverage um just talking a little bit about what it is and just where did it come from just what is the history um of it? i think that might be a good place to start to kind of set the stage for some of the you know what we'll be talking about today yeah absolutely um so kombucha is an ancient health elixir. Um, it is a tea ferment, so it's mostly green or black tea, or sometimes a mix of both, um, fermented with sugar and a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast called the SCOBY, um, also called the mother culture. And um, it's been around for over 2000 years, so um, it's quite old, um, just as the whole concept of fermentation is. Um, you know, the whole concept of fermentation is that folks used to use fermentation 
uh, like kombucha and, and sauerkraut and, and pickles and all of that fun stuff as a way to preserve food in the olden days. And so it was more um, a necessity instead of a, a craft and a, a kind of a, a fun thing to do. It was like they were preserving to save their lives and to sustain for their families. And so, yeah, the whole concept of fermentation is, is ancient. Um, and kombucha is the probably one of the most widely known um, uh, beverage ferments that's uh, a non-alcoholic drink. So yeah, um, kombucha is basically really good for you. Um, so we think it's got probiotics in it. Um, that's you know due to the fermentation. Um, it also has a lot of vitamins B12 and vitamins B12. C and amino acids and maltic acids, all sorts of great acids for your body. Um, and uh, it's bubbly, it can be flavored, um, and it's just fun to drink. And Sam brews it all in our facility here in Atlanta. Oh, nice. So Sam, that process of brewing kombucha for, for folks who may have either home brewed such as yourself, I mentioned as well that I, I had a stack of scobies for a while. Um, uh, mm -hmm. What does a, a large scale space brewing, fermenting kombucha, what does that look like? Do you have, is it many jars of scobies or is there a, a, a master mother scoby? I, but just, what does that look like? Because if folks are more used to maybe have a brewery, what is, you know, a place that makes kombucha, what does that look like? Sure. Yeah. It's honestly, it's not that far off from what you imagine a beer brewery to look like. Um, it can vary from technique or flavor profile that you're looking for. Um, with a smaller ferment, you're going to get more control versus just like a massive tank um, and the largest mother you've ever seen. Uh, it's less controllable, actually. So ideally, like someone like us, like Golda, would use uh, old oak barrels from anywhere from like wineries. Uh, I tend to like those profiles better uh, or somewhere that has done like coffee to get like those different bacteria into the barrels. Um, but sometimes you see fermenters uh, like traditional wine open top fermenters. Um, so they'd be stainless steel. They could be 3000 liters. They could be as small as 20. Um, so the big difference that you see between a beer brewery and kombucha is actually open top. Because the key with that is kombucha actually wants oxygen, whereas beer would oxidize and the bacteria, and there's a lot of negativity in there when it comes to beer. <laughs> right um, so that's the, the main difference. Great. And um, thank you for that, Sam. Um, and Sally, as far as, so I'd love if you could speak just a little bit about, you know, it is beer, it comes in a can, it tastes great, but obviously that with there being without, you know, with the the absence of alcohol, it is a growing category, but as I mentioned, it's definitely not a new idea. Um, and so I know as well, you're a certified Cicero, and so you definitely have that background in in beer. Um, just would you mind just speaking a little bit to kind of where did non-alcoholic beer come from? How long has it been around? Um, in, 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 as far as your understanding of that history, yeah. well. Non-alcoholic beer has been around, I mean, probably almost as long as regular beer has been around, but it's been kind of in the, the popular consciousness for, you know, at least the past five decades or so. But um, it's seeing a huge surge in popularity right now. Um, the craft non-alcoholic category is actually up over 440% over, you know, over last, uh, last year. And uh, in athletic beer, we have a, about 50% share of that category. But um uh, but our non-alcoholic beer, it again, it is absolutely beer. Um, it's brewed with the same four ingredients that are in all beer: You've got barley malt, water, hops, and yeast. Um, but the uh, the brewing process is tweaked in several different ways in order to brew a fully fermented uh, non-alcoholic beer. At Athletic, we we do it a little bit differently than a lot of like the the larger um, the larger non-alcoholic brands that you're probably familiar with, like your Sharps and your jewels and some others such as that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with them, but um, but there's different ways of taking the alcohol out of beer. Like you know, vapor distillation is one, basically boiling the alcohol out of the beer. And, and we don't do that. And uh, I don't actually know how we do it because uh, um, our brewer knows, our brewing team knows, and uh, I'm on the sales side and I don't, I don't need to know. And so I kind of don't want to know because it's, uh, it's proprietary and, um, 
and it's just it's it's like a fun secret. <laughs> so so again, we do some tweaks to the basic uh, brewing process of um, you know turning um, barley malt water and hops into beer with the aid of yeast, and um, and uh, again, it's just delicious beer that happens to not have alcohol in it. So it's it's it was perfect for me. As you mentioned, I'm a certified Cicerone and uh, I'm also a middle upper middle-aged woman and I was getting some really unhealthy habits. I came from 15 years um, selling on the distributor side, just selling regular craft beer. And, you know, when you sell beer for 15 years, you know, you go out a lot and you tend to drink a lot, you know, it's almost, it's hard to, to get away from that. And um, so I had been looking for, just a way to satisfy, you know, my, my craving for craft beer and for the, the beer taste that I loved without, you know, without the calories and without the alcohol and without the hangovers. And, uh, and so I found athletic and it's been, it's been fantastic. That's great. Um, thank you for sharing. And that, that actually um, takes us to where we are today. So you, ha you know, you have two brands, um, into you know two different types of beverages here that um, not only have continued to grow in demand, but also the the market for non-alcoholic options, whether they be, you know be fermented in many ways, like that has grown significantly um, over the past, even more so it's it, even more so in the past two years, but has been growing steadily over the past five years. And um, and Melanie, I'd love to start with you too with um, starting a you know starting your company um what i guess even just that timeline what is what what have you seen as far as the growth of the category over time even if we kind of want to take it like so you can we start with kombucha but even in general that sort of non-alcoholic fermented beverage um what has that been like as you've grown your company i mean it's um we're seeing a lot more demand and folks looking for options, so. Yeah, we absolutely are. So when I started um, brewing kombucha, and, and by the way, I like to say I got my mother from my grandmother. Um, my grandmother's name is Golda, and she lived to be 99 years old, and she taught me how to make kombucha. So um, I, I learned her recipe, got her mother culture, and went to brewing um, at home, and then uh, started our our brewery um, in 2013. So we're coming on our seventh year. So um, when I started brewing kombucha commercially, there was crickets in the background. There was hardly anyone that knew what kombucha was when I brought it up in conversation. Um, the regulating bodies in Georgia, um, they had no idea what kombucha was. And I had to kind of give them a lesson of fermentation 101. And this is what we're doing. And yes, it's good for you. And no, it's not going to harm you unless, you know, you do it the wrong way, but we're doing it the right way and all these things. And they were just, you know, they had no idea what was going on. And um, so essentially I, you know, pointed to um, one of the, the larger kombucha companies called GT Dave's, um, which if you go to like any store they're they're on the shelf there in the glass bottle and i said you know this is what we're doing but we're going to do it in a craft way and in a local way you know here in georgia and that was kind of like they're like oh okay like this is a category this is a, a thing that's emerging but you know there's other people doing this out there in the country and so um i basically you know took that and um, ran with it and um you know it's been a long interesting journey um, because there was a lot of education to do. Um, you know, people still sometimes don't know how to pronounce kombucha. They say, you know, kombuchi, you know, kombucha, you know, all these different things. And I'm like, no, it's kombucha <laughs> um, or booch for short. And so there's a lot of education to do. Um, you know, we started out by just, you know, grassroots marketing, going to a lot of farmers markets and a lot of festivals and just really getting people to try the product. Um, because I think once, you know, you take that first sip of kombucha, you're just, you're not, you don't expect it to be good, but it is really good, at least ours is. And a lot of people, you know, think it's gonna be this like salad dressing, like really sharp vinegar. And some of them can be, 
Um, but at Golden Kombucha, we really pride ourselves on having a really mild and mellow brew. And that's kind of like our claim to fame. And so when we were first educating the, you know, greater Atlanta area and the state of Georgia and, and you know, banding up with other brewers in the southeast that were doing kombucha and, and kind of non-alcoholic fermentation, it was kind of this like, okay, well, we're creating this category where we're kind of putting it out there. We're testing the waters. We're seeing what we can do with it. And we don't really know how it's going to go. I mean, like it was, it was a really pioneering, you know, kind of scary thing to get into business seven years ago doing kombucha because no one really knew what it was. Um, but, you know, time would tell that it actually caught on pretty well. And now I think if you go to like pretty much every, you know, major city in America, there's a kombucha company or two, you know, that's brewing. So, so that's great. And um, it really just kind of helps educate not only just the Southeast, but the entire country and even the entire world about, you know, what kombucha is, how it's healthy for you and, um, you know, why you should be drinking it. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of education, um, a lot of fun. Um, not all fun and games though, a lot of a lot of risk, a lot of, you know, hard work, but um, definitely worthwhile. And I, it's interesting when you talk about the education because, you know, you were coming, you came on so early in the market in the US, I believe, you know, that you had to educate, you know, the state officials and what is, what is this? No, it's not alcohol, um, but it could be. I. Kombucha is also a category where there wasn't a lot of regulation in the early years nationally, right? And there was a lot, there was, you know, a, not a lot of kind of collective organizations and larger, I guess, regulation, I guess, is the, be is the best way. Yeah, to there, there was definitely a, a lack of, um, you know, regulation and a lack of like, you know, um, really just I go back to ed education, but there's really like awareness about it. So, um, Right around the time when I started the business, 2012, 2013, um, uh, an organization, a, a trade organization emerged called Kombucha Brewers International. Um, and I served on the board there. I was a secretary to the board for four years. And that um, organization was, you know, very similar to a lot of the craft beer organizations in that it's it's really about bonding companies together that are brewing kombucha properly and and ha and doing it with authenticity and originality and and not just making some, you know, product with synthesized probiotics and some you know, acetic acid in it. It's it's about really, you know, brewing and, and really honing in on that craft. And so I think that, you know, I would contribute KBI, Kombucha Brewers International, um, President Hannah Crum with a lot of a lot of uh, education and awareness and, and grassroots marketing on the entire category of kombucha. And so I think it's really important, you know, as we look at like craft beverage as a whole to to participate in those organizations and to support them um, and to be a part of them because that's really like what's, you know, helping educate the, the greater population. That's great. And um, Sally, I'd love to throw it to you for a moment because non-alcoholic beer has gone through I, I guess more so on the on the store shelf, you might see one or two national brands, you know, say five to 10 years ago. We won't name them. We don't need to name them. That's not why we're here. But as far right. as that category growing, was there a level? I mean, there's obviously a level of education on the consumer side, but um, are you aware as far as the sort of regulatory sort of understanding as these as there are more and more brands coming onto the market, um, what is have you, have there been any observations that you've seen over time um, that have been similar to what Melanie spoke to? Well, as far as uh, regulation goes of of non alcoholic craft beer, it actually varies from state to state, much in the way that regulation of regular beer varies from state to state. Um, for example, um, we do not ship our products to homes in Michigan because you know they're it's illegal to to ship beer, you know in the state of Michigan. And there's a few other states that are like that as well. But uh, but for the most part, because of our non-alcoholic status, um, the regulations are, are very much the same as like a, a can of soda pop or something like that. So for example, if we do uh, tasting in a grocery store or just outside a grocery store, it's something that we call cans in hand because we just hand out full cans of our, of our non-alcoholic craft beer. And it's just, 
in terms of regulations are concerned, it's just like a bottle of soda or a bottle of water or something of that nature. So it's it's pretty nice in that way. It's a, it's a lot more, um, a lot looser restrictions than with alcoholic beer. And it then it enables people to, to enjoy the beer a lot more frequently. That's again, something that I really enjoy about it is, you know, I could, I don't happen to have one with me right now, but I could, I could have a craft beer right now and just be fine for the rest of the day, you know. Absolutely. Sam, I saw that you were maybe drinking possibly some kombucha. <laughs> yeah. I think I drink way too much kombucha, but yeah, around this time of day, I always have a pint. Right <laughs> yeah. And so for you, Sam, in, in, in the role as, of a brewer, you know, at this point, there are, as Melanie shared, there's, there's, it's, it's codified no more. There's more, you know, obviously there's regulations and organizations and things like that. Um, what I guess I would say, what has it been like for you in the, you know, I know you've been with Golda for a couple of years, I believe, but just, you know, being a home brewer, just seeing the category grow. Are you, have you seen that there's been either more of a, an understanding of non-alcoholic fermented beverages like kombucha or what has been your experience as you've seen as the market has grown over time? I want to say it's more and more of an understanding, like more and more people think they understand like how we create kombucha. And it makes it a lot easier to talk about our flavors rather than simply how to make kombucha. So like from a selling point, I can imagine it's definitely made it far easier. And from like a regulation standpoint, it, it helps like back up what we believe is true like as a home brewer for 10 years, you know, every week you're like, does my SCOBY look right? Like, let me Google that. How do I know if my SCOBY's right? And like, even today, like every other month, it's like, wait, it's doing something completely different than it's ever done before. I've never seen this. How do I know? And it's, it's kind of, it's kind of fascinating that there's way more articles out there. There's more knowledge, there's more study, there's lab studies. Um, and it makes it, I don't know. It makes it like uh, we can make a better, stronger product, too, because um, you can eliminate any of the, I don't know, uh, methods that might not be as, like, essential, too. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. No, it definitely does. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's in, in thinking about these, the, you know, again, the growing market share over time, that all lands with, you know, and regulations, which is good. But that all that comes from consumer and consumers wanting it. Right. So um, mm -hmm. would love to. Um, and we can maybe do this popcorn style, whoever feels more, you know, whoever um, just talking about who who is it that's drinking these these beverages? You know, is it is it folks that, you know, are maybe gluten free or, you know, who who choose not to drink? Is it um, is it folks who, you know, is it? Is it the version of an omnivore, someone yeah. who drinks, who drinks uh, NA and, and, and beverages with and without. Um, but I'd love to speak to that because the market, you know, talking about the consumer interest and who it is that is drinking these beverages. Whoever I mean, yeah. Well, you from the standpoint of Sam right here, who's one of the perfect demographics of kombucha drinkers, Sam's uh, gluten intolerant. So, you know, she loves cider and loves drinking kombucha. Um, can't really drink a lot of beer. So, you know, she's target demographic right there. And, uh, you know, I, I really think that all kombucha, it can be consumed from kids to um, aging adults, you know, everyone in between. We have a lot of kids that come into the kombucha bar just, you know, mommy, daddy, let me have the kombucha, just downing it, you know. And, and then we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, senior folks that are coming in and enjoying kombucha instead of beer, um, you know, and and all sorts of people in between. I mean, it, it does, with kombucha, we don't discriminate. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I would I would agree with that too. Um, I mean, at Athletic, we always say you know we're we're craft beer lovers at heart, but we also enjoy like being healthy and active at our at our best and not having that foggy feeling after consuming alcohol. Um, so really our consumer is anybody who might enjoy a, a great craft beer or also anybody who might like typically pick up a soda on a Saturday afternoon, but one, you know, but is a craft beer drinker, you know, it's also perfect for that person. We're not, we're not a soapbox company at all in terms of, we don't 
preach sobriety. You know, we don't necessarily go out and say, you know, this beer is only for pregnant women or this beer is only for people who are, you know, wanting to not drink alcohol at all anymore. Because I, I certainly still do drink alcohol, you know, from time to time, but a lot a lot less than, than I did before I, I, I came across athletic. But uh, but I'm um, speaking to market share and Stephanie, I feel like you, you started to touch on that a little bit and I'm, I'm sure you all can have seen this in the market as well. Just the amount of shelf space that retailers are devoting to non-alcoholic has just is growing exponentially. And I think we're going to see that trend continue for a while. I'm sure you all are seeing, you know, besides your own kombucha, quite a few other kombuchas on the shelf. Shit. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it's, it's good to, to see the category emerging just like craft beer. You know, when you're looking on the shelf and you're seeing um, all different, you know, kinds of uh, different ways of brewing, different ingredients. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really just following the same path as, as craft beer. So. Absolutely. And in a way that kind of makes it a little easier to sell our product because it's again, spreading knowledge of what kombucha is. So they already yep. have an understanding. It's easier for them to pick up a can at Kroger now mm -hmm. without like questioning what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look for yours. I really enjoy kombucha, but I don't believe I've, I've tried yours yet. <laughs> yeah. You should check us out. We've got a kombucha tap room um, right on the belt line at the Lee and White development. Uh, <laughs> that is right behind Amazing. Um, yeah, and so we're uh, we're Georgia's first kombucha brewery and, and first kombucha tap room as well. Um, so yeah, come and check us out, um, 1038 White Street, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it's called the Cultured South Tap Room because we do, we do more than kombucha there, but uh, you know, we, we have like 15 different flavors of kombucha on tap, so. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and Sam, I'd love to come back to you for a minute because as Melanie said, the is a version, of, you know, um, one of the ideal customers for kombucha as far as um, sort of it being an accessible thing to drink. So if you feel comfortable, but um, uh, but I think that's that um, perspective is valid because I, I will just share briefly just as I was someone who did not drink for a long time and I drank a lot of club soda and lime in places because that was all that was there. So. Um, it's exciting to see the category grow. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's definitely exciting. I mean, I became aware of kombucha probably like when I was 20, 21, and around then I didn't have an understanding that I had a gluten intolerance. Um, but to see my transition in my own health throughout the last like 10 years has really been incredible and like having access to being able to brew my own all the time. It's, um, and I'm not the only one that views that. Like I, I've covered shifts in our tap room as we've mentioned that we have over here. Um, our demographic really is from kids to grandparents and from gluten issues to just digestion. Um, we also do water kefir. So that's another like good source of natural probiotics too. Um, and I find like balancing that is, I don't know, it's a life changer too. Right on. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. I, so see, we have a comment here um, from JW, or comment slash question from JW Richard. I noticed that Golda Kombucha has Milligrams. milligrams. Thank you. I was like, I was like, milligrams <laughs> of CBD. Would love to know if that brings what that brings to the experience of the booch. Also for Sally, curious if you know if Athletic will bring some brews with CBD soon. Yeah. So this is a this is a really hot topic, guys. Um, putting CBD in beverage, um, you know, that's the whole category in and of itself. But um, but yeah, to, to answer J.W. Richard's question, so we, we started brewing CBD kombucha right when the farm bill passed. Um, I believe it was 2018. So we, we hit the ground running, started doing it in our tap room and on tap at little restaurants and bars around Atlanta. Um, the demand was there, so we actually started canning it. So um, we produce um, a few different flavors in the can, um, but the, the first one and the most popular one is the hot Georgia citrus, which is uh, infused with 20 milligrams of a broad spectrum CBD. And it also is made with satsuma juice from a local Georgia farm called Georgia Grown Citrus down in South Georgia. And um, Sam dry hops this one. So it's got citra, cosmic hops in it 
um, Galaxy. Yeah, it's just it's got a lot of a lot of similar properties to beer, um, but no alcohol and plenty of CBD that kind of gives you that um, you know euphoric effect without really having to feel like you're, you're drinking and having that you know the alcohol um, being a you know depressant as it is bringing you down. Uh, so a lot of our customers love our CBD products because it kind of gives you that euphoria and that relaxed state, but without the alcohol. Um, so, you know, for me, like I take a lot of CBD in the evening time as I'm trying to wind down. Um, it helps me sleep, it helps me relax and de-stress. So I think a lot of folks are, are really loving our, our citrus hop CBD, um, especially because it's made with, you know, local local fruits and and awesome hops in there for a little bit of that beer flavor that, that sounds so great um we've got we actually have we have two breweries our original athletic uh brewery is in stratford connecticut and recently uh, actually in 2020 we um we acquired a larger brewing facility in san diego and so we have we have two tap rooms um the first two tap rooms I, as i understand it that are devoted 100% to non-alcoholic craft beer. But um, but uh, to answer answer the question, um, I believe our brewers are working on something um, that involves CBD. Um, I don't believe we'll have anything like that out before the end of 2021, because the brewing schedule is pretty much set, as you know, as Sam I'm sure knows, that you, you kind of need to, to plan ahead, especially when you're brewing on the kind of scale that we're lucky enough to be able to do right now. But uh, our brewers are always doing some cool things. Uh, we've got um, a really fantastic Oktoberfest coming out. I mean, I know it's that's still a few months away, but uh, we just uh, finished up our, our Goza season. So that's our, 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 our beer made with some lime and some sea salt. But um, we've got new limited uh, offerings on, on our website really frequently. And we also on our website, uh, not available in distribution yet, but we have... Um, something called day pack, which is a hoppy seltzer, which I also really enjoy. And it comes in, uh, in all natural fruit flavors, um, mango, um, lemon, lime, uh, black cherry. And there's one other one that I can't think of right now, but uh, those are available on our website as well. So CBD probably eventually, but uh, we've got the craft beers and hoppy seltzer for right now. I'll definitely want to come back to CBD because that definitely is as the future of fermentation and, and talk. And yeah. I love it. Um, but for the moment, I'd love to stick to kind of center back, like the experience of drinking these beverages. So folks who might go to a craft brewery or a winery, there is an experience of going to, you know, a tap room and having that. And, you know, um, the the idea of collecting and aging and all of that sort of culture around beer. I, I guess the question would be for, for y'all, like what is the culture around for, for consumers around um, these fermented beverages? you know, you can, you know, with kombucha, you can make cocktails and you can, do, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with it. Um, and with NA beer, you know, there's definitely opportunities and a big culture that's grown around that as well. And I would love to talk a little bit more about, um, about that and how folks and not only how do they drink it and have interest in it, but how, you know, again, the culture around those products. Yeah, well, I think the answer to that question is you've got to cultivate the culture, <laughs> right? So you've got to you've got to cultivate it, and um, and you've got to grow it, and you have to create and you have to pioneer. Um, without being a you know a pioneer and, and making up new flavors and creating an experience in a tap room, um, an event centered around kombucha and you know all the different things, without those, you're really just kind of you know create just creating what's already been done before with craft beer and going through those motions and just kind of following the herd so to speak but um i think what's important is you've kind of got to make yourself stand out a little bit but also create some sense of like normalcy um and that tap room space kind of does that you know and that you know uh, beer tap rooms have been around for forever you know, kombucha tap rooms are kind of a new phenomenon that's happening. Um, so you you want to kind of have that sense of normalcy and that some sense of familiarity with the tap room aspect. And you see, like, you know, you've got your your taps. You can do a flight. You can do a pint. Whatever it might be. Um, but you know, 
do different things. So like we do uh, a bend and booch. It's a yoga and kombucha hour. Um, you know, we, we, um, we do all sorts of different like art events um, and just, you know, really fun things and pairing it with, um, with, with interesting food. So like I know in some, you know, beer tap rooms, you might be able to go there and grab like a hot dog, a hamburger, a barbecue, whatever. Um, at our tap room, we actually offer our own line of um, cafe style food, like a vegan cheese board and, and vegan panini grilled cheese sandwiches and, and hummus and veggies. So we kind of take a little bit of that like healthier spin on it um, because we recognize that our, our, our target demographic and our customers are really more in line and kin to that healthy lifestyle rather than, you know, the greasy fried foods and all of that stuff that you might find that you're like typically. Cool, um, you know, beer brewery. So it's kind of like creating a, a new experience, but also kind of keeping in line with what's, you know, been done before and not, not really creating, you know, a whole new vibe, but kind of going along with the vibe that's already been created in the beer industry. Right on. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, sorry, Sally. <laughs> Oh no! I was just uh, I was I was just gonna say like yeah we don't really um, at least as of right now we don't we don't have any anything that is like made to be cellared as you mentioned you know a lot of like like craft beer people you know like to to get the big barley wines or the big you know heavy high ABV barley stouts and and cellar those but uh, I mean all of our products are, are made to be to be consumed fresh as possible but. Uh, you know, who knows, like, like I say, the brewers are always up to something. We try to, uh, to keep something interesting and new on the website at all times. Like we just uh, did a collaboration with Justin's peanut butter. We did a, a peanut butter porter called Nature Nut, which is really, really fantastic. And uh, there's always something new coming out from, from our brewers. And uh, we do a lot of outreach as well. 2% um, of all of our sales go to uh, various environmental outreach programs as well as impact programs. Um, we have a, a scholarship uh, for people of color in Connecticut. Um, we do a lot of collaboration beers with, with different people, you know, and we and donate the proceeds to, to different causes. So we try to be really active, you know, in, the, in just sort of like living the life that, that we want to live and promoting that, that healthier lifestyle and just promoting a, a good lifestyle for everybody who drinks our beer. Right on. Um, and within the non-alcoholic space, in beer space, I should say, um, do you find that the, you might see in beer like trading and kind of the hype beers and things like that? I, I feel like the hype culture is real in NA beer still. Is that is yeah. that what your understanding is as well, uh, Sally? Or I've, I got to tell you, it's actually really taken me by surprise. You know, there's a, a couple of non-alcoholic beer um, enthusiasts. Like there's a couple of different Facebook groups. There's a lot of different groups on social media where um, I don't know if people necessarily trade, but I have heard about like people in Michigan, for example, like I've, I've, as I said, you know, we're, we don't ship beer to Michigan, but uh, you know, you didn't hear this from me, but I've heard about people, you know, shipping beer to people around Michigan and then, you know, getting, getting it into to the state that way. Um, but there's a lot, there's, there's so many different options now. There's so many different breweries that are creating great non-alcoholic craft beer that uh, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of action on social media with people collecting people, you know, who love our all out stout, which is our, our winter seasonal um, who are looking for, you know, a great, non-alcoholic stout or perhaps you know just some other non-alcoholic style that's their favorite a lot of people are excited about our our free wave which is our hazy ipa but uh but it's, it's pretty cool for me to see the number of people who are really excited about you know just sharing their love of non-alcoholic craft beer it's really something so ultimately na na beverages are here to stay looking for i mean they've been here but they're 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 here to stay um so looking at the i i just realized the culture the culture was a, a little bit of a I, I did not mean to be that punny i apologize friends <laughs> <laughs> that worked though our whole um, name is a pun so it's fine <laughs> we're cultured south so it doesn't get any yeah. more funny than that <laughs> um you you had mentioned before melanie um water 
I believe, or was it Sam? I can't recall. Water kefir. That is that mm -hmm. fermented beverage as well, right? Yeah, um, water kefir is like the the sister product to kombucha, essentially. So um, kombucha is made with you know the tea fermented. Water kefir is made with uh, sugar water, so essentially like sweetened water, um, and you can sweeten with you know a variety of different um, substances. But most popular folks are going to be using um, molasses, and that's because it kind of gives a little bit more nutrients and 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 minerals to that ferment. Um, so yeah, so water kefir, I I I personally love water kefir. There's some days where I'll, I'll just drink water kefir all day instead of kombucha but um water kefir is a little bit more mild and mellow so if you're like just starting out into this like world of uh fermented beverages that are not beer um i would definitely recommend trying out a water kefir first it's kind of gonna you know provide you with a little bit of that fermentation um you know it's definitely fermented but it doesn't have that fermented funky taste to it it doesn't have a whole lot of acidic acid at all so um it's a quick ferment you can make it at home um super easy but yeah it's it's just kind of a beginner's kombucha i would say but totally separate culture than kombucha separate microbiome situation so yeah it's it's a fun it's a fun one and um we make we make like a rose water kefir that's really popular we have that on tap and uh we're gonna be canning some water kefir soon too and it, it's just really light so it allows the flavors to really come through like we're doing uh a grandma's garden water kefir right now with some lemon balm and um, you can just really taste it because lemon balm can can be such a very fragile um, you know herb that it, it really kind of takes a lot of it to to bring it out so the water kefir kind of makes it a little bit more uh, noticeable nice is that so cool i just want to interject there's it's so exciting to me that there's so many options now right there's so many different things for people to drink. And, you know, of course, there have always been a million flavors of soda, right? But there's, there's so many options now for people who, for whatever reason, you know, whether they're they're sober or whether they're, you know, just not wanting to drink on that day for what, you know, if they've got a big test or a big run the next day or whatever it may be. It's so exciting to me that, you know, you mentioned, you know, like uh, like sodas and limes, you know, that you don't have to stand at the bar anymore and just have a soda and a lime, or you don't have to be that person who's like mm -hmm. at a bar with their friends and drinking five diet cokes or whatever it may be. You know, there's things like I've never heard of Waterkeeper, and that's super exciting. It's just I'm I'm just really gratified that that there are so many options now for people who choose not to drink alcohol for whatever reason. Yeah, absolutely. With water kefir, is that a category? Like looking at what we've spoken about with non-alcoholic beer and kombucha, is water kefir? Is that still more of a specialty offering or do you see that increasing in market share as well? Or is that specific to more health and wellness um, folks who are looking maybe more in that to as a goal to drink it for wellness? That's an interesting question because, you know, we've been bringing water kefir for a few years now. And, you know, I've, I've been, you know, on the water kefir game for quite a while, but it hasn't exploded quite like kombucha has. And I don't know that it will um, because I think there again, there's still a lot of education that has to be done about water kefir. Like, you know, Sally was just saying she, she hasn't heard of water kefir. So there's still a lot of people that don't know now. And there's also two different kinds of kefir. So oftentimes when we're talking about water kefir, people will be like, well, is that the milky product? Is that like the yogurt? And the answer is no. Uh, still both kefirs, but different grains. We call them kefir grains. They're not, they're not actually a, a plant. That's just, they look like grains. So that's what people call them. It's like the culture. Um, but, um, but so essentially, you know, with the water kefir and the milk kefir, people get are getting them confused often. Um, so you kind of have to really make sure you're emphasizing, no, this is, you know, dairy free. This is a water kefir, not uh, a creamy, you know, yogurt type product. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure why water kefir hasn't exploded quite like kombucha. M maybe it will. Hopefully it will. I mean, I, I love water kefir. I, I just think it's great. And it's a lot quicker of a ferment. So from a manufacturing standpoint, it's, it's, you know, easier to make too. 
that's awesome. And I hope that we've introduced some new, some more folks to water kefir as well. Um, <laughs> so we've, it looks like we've got quite a few questions, uh, but before we jump into those questions and comments, um, I'd love to, you know, we talked a little bit about it with the CBD, but just even talking about the future of fermented beverages as, as, as much as we can predict. Um, we're seeing increasing share. Folks are, are diversifying what they're drinking and it's not limited to alcohol versus non-alcohol. Um, but would love to, um, yeah, just again, popcorn style, just what, what do you think the future holds for fermented beverages, especially with innovations like, you know, CBD, you know, you know, day pack, I've tried it. It's, it's lovely, you know, hop, uh, hopped water seltzers and things like that. So, um, Well, I mean, I feel like the sky's the limit, you know, I mean, who could have guessed and something that I say almost every day, just in my day to day work life, like who would have guessed, you know, four years ago, where alcoholic seltzers are now, you know, and now, you know, there's, there's so many of us who are focused on, on non, non alcoholic, be it beer or be it kombucha or, you know, different kinds of different kinds of, you know, the, the keeper water or the water keeper, excuse me, and, you know, different kinds of beverages. So, you know, I think that there's probably going to, we're probably going to see some, some beverages made with, with THC as well as CBD as that becomes more and more legalized across the country. And I feel like, I feel like that possibly, I mean, it's just a theory of mine, but I feel like that's possibly one of the reasons why non-alcoholics have seen such growth in the past few years. I, I remember when I first started with, with athletic, I was, um, I took my dog to the groomer and my, my dog groomer was about 25 years old. And, you know, I, I took her some beer and I said, you know, here, you know, try this, you know, non-alcoholic craft beer. And she's like, Oh, this is amazing. None of my friends, you know, none of us drink anymore, you know? So I feel like it's kind of a generational shift in that, you know, when I was growing up, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, you went out to the bars and that doesn't seem to ha be happening quite as much, or, you know, maybe there's different kinds of bars or different kinds of activities that people do on weekends. And, uh, so I, like I say, I feel like the sky's the limit. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for in some markets, you know, maybe some, some different beverages made with THC. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's going to be a lot more people making non-alcoholic beer in the near future. Um, I think there's probably going to be more kombucha makers. I think, I think the, the real difference is going to come down to, you know, who's making the best quality product and the people, the, the product that people can get excited about and, and, return to purchase again and again, you know, ultimately, um, I know it's not necessarily what we're talking about, but the brands that last tend to be the ones that people kind of fall in love with and embrace and, you know, again, continue to purchase. So I think that's the direction we're going to see. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think that, you know, the non-alcoholic craft beverages are, are definitely here to stay. Um, we're finding that more and more uh, beer breweries and beer tap rooms are purchasing um, products like Golda Kombucha to, to offer folks um, that are wanting that tap room experience, but don't necessarily, you know, want to be drinking or can't drink, you know, um, uh, so designated drivers, you know, there's there's always uh, that option too. So you know, it's providing them something so that they can feel like they're part of the party, right? But without having to intoxicate them. Um, but they're still drinking something craft and something cool and a brand that they can fall in love with and and they can um, you know follow and and just uh, really you know you know, get behind what they're doing. And so, yeah, I think, you know, um, we're, we're seeing a really big uptick of businesses um, like bars and, uh, you know, bar heavy restaurants carrying our product. And I think it's just, you know, for, for the store or for the bar, it's great because they're, they're making money off of, the, the canned kombucha or the kombucha on tap that's pouring or, you know, the, the, the seltzer, hop seltzer water, whatever, they're making money off those products. Whereas um, if they were just getting like a club soda with a lime, I mean, that's, that's free. Like who's going to charge for that really? So it's like, it's, it's a good game all around for all folks involved. Um, whether that be the business owner at the bars and restaurants and tap rooms um, you know, the consumer that's looking for something a little bit different, but non-alcoholic. And then for uh, for the brands like Golda Kombucha and Athletic Brewing, I mean, it, we're creating a category, we're pioneering, and um, it's, it's definitely here to stay. 
could agree more. Oh, oh Sam, I think you're muted. <laughs> there you go. Um, I definitely see it as a continuously growing uh, field. Uh, from what I can tell, it's not just going out to bars and not wanting to drink, but it's like changing to alternatively healthy lifestyles. So like there was a huge boom in the early 2000s of going out to bars, like an, an increased amount of alcohol consumption. And that is slowly changing, like people getting out of college, people getting over COVID, for example, getting through the pandemic, they're changing more into a healthier lifestyle, whether that be with CBD's help or to non-alcoholic beer. Um, and it's, our products are helping with that transition. You know, it's not like a huge go from the bar scene to absolutely nothing. You can still come to a healthy tap room or see us out at bars. So I definitely see that continuing. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, yep. Jen commented, she's in the chat, this opens the door to a whole lifestyle shift for consumers in the beverage industry. And I definitely agree. Um, I'm going to take a peek mm -hmm. in the chat and take, and um, we've got some questions. And then, um, yeah, thank you again for, for y'all for um, chatting with me on this topic. It's been great. Um, so it looks like the first question looks like, Sam, this may be for you. Um, are there any dangers or things to look out for when brewing your own, I'm assuming kombucha, at home? I think the word dangers are a little, a little strict. I think the biggest things to watch out for uh, is SCOBY formations. Um, the big thing is like any changes in your SCOBY can like be a significant like sign. Um, but the biggest things to look for is your SCOBY dropping and flies keep the flies out uh those are like the two main things that i i would be weary of um and adding too much sugar you can actually overwhelm the yeast and bacteria balance so too much sugar can actually throw it out of whack and almost put it into a pause and then that's when the bad bacteria can enter in so and sam real quick balance. like if you don't mind indulging a, a beer geek question, like what 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 temperature fermentation do you use? Temperature, you said? Yeah, I'm so yeah, I'm so curious about that. I I find a sweet spot around 79, um, but yeah. kombucha can ferment anywhere cool. from like 70 to about a max of 88. Oh, cool. Okay. Give or take. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Sorry, it's a natural it's product, so out. like I just like to know how things are made. That's yeah, awesome. it's great. Like yeah, the, yeah. the faster the ferment, the hotter it's actually going to be. Like you will see that it actually like amps up in a couple of degrees, like the day after brewing. Sure. That makes sense. Cool. So, yeah, thank a little, you. A little bit more natural and less controlled than beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Um, the next question is what's the market like for other fermented non-alcoholic alternatives? Like some well CBD water and kefir looks like we've, uh, and what's on the horizon. It looks like we may have, covered a lot of that, but for a moment, is there anything we missed in addressing that question? Because that's, that's definitely seems like it's, you know, the CBD THC seems like that is a growing category and depending on the state, of course, yeah. um, in those laws. Mm -hmm. There's uh, I mean, the CBD category is huge. Um, there's people doing a, a ferment called Tapache, which is um, pineapple um, skin ferment. So that's pretty tasty. I, I've, I've seen a few commercial brands putting that in the, in the can or um, in the bottle, and, and that's really awesome to see. Um, there is uh, a new phenomenon called uh, kombucha seltzers, which is kind of taking that like flavor of kombucha and then giving it that like sparkling water seltzer um, taste to it as well. So you're kind of getting a little bit of the tartness, but not as much as a full body kombucha and a little bit more light and refreshing. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, um, let's see what else, Sam, did I, what did I miss? There's, there's people are just pioneering all, all different things. I mean, um, Switchel is another thing that is, uh, that we're, we're actually working on right now. Um, Switchel is an apple cider vinegar, um, drink that is usually, uh, what's called an oxymel, which is an acid and a sweetener such as honey or agave or, um, maple syrup or something like that. So, um, Switchel is kind of the, uh, 
the Haymakers Punch or like the first Gatorade um, goes back to colonial times. So it's got a really rich history there as well. It's what folks used um, out in the fields when they were needing to, to harvest and pull long days and, you know, needing to hydrate and get their electrolytes in. So it has a little bit of salt in it as well. Um, so yeah, Switchell's awesome. We're working on uh, canning something like that right now, actually. Yeah. And as far as different ferments, I have been experimenting with the cocoa husks in replace of tea for our kombucha. And that's coming out like a kind of balanced, creamy, tart, yet refreshing beverage too. So. Yeah. And there's also Jun, which is a, a green tea and honey ferment. So Jun, Jun is a like type of kombucha. Um, it's still a, it's, fermented, but instead of using sugar as the fermenting agent, it's using honey. So traditionally it's a green tea and a honey ferment. And we have that on tap at the Culture South Tap in Wow, well, that sounds amazing. Um, well, just uh, coming out new from Athletic really quick, and uh, this will be available again on the website. Um, Rainbow Wall is gonna be our beer for, uh, for Pride Month, and I'm super excited about it. That's gonna be a, a blood orange IPA. So just something to look for. And again, you know, after that, we've got uh, our October Festival will be coming out in just a few months. And then uh, we've got a new winter seasonal, which is, um, I, I don't have the name of it right off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it's a red IPA. And it's, um, it's, how can I say this? It's similar in taste in, to my past, to a very, very popular um, holiday craft beer favorite. And I'm kind of obsessed with it, our, 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 hol our new holiday seasonal. So, uh, so all of those are, are going to be coming from our brewery very soon. Nice. Um, and another comment I'd love to share, share just to tie in, and you, we, in different ways we've spoken about this, this um, but Nicole here shares that this ties into the last talk on creating welcoming tap rooms by having options for everyone on the menu. Love it. And that idea, especially, you know, that the all spoken to um, is that idea of being being welcoming to all folks, regardless, you know, that there was options for everyone. And I would say that is a really great thing. Um, you know, so, you know, you have someone else in the comments here looking for any options um, for their brewery in Knoxville. Um, so it's not only is it folks who are doing their own thing, but pulling in those options to, you know, making sure you have that, that um, great tasty beverage experience for someone, whether they be designated driver or they're just not about drinking. Um, yeah. so that's, yeah. that's great to see that piece of it as well. Um, it's 2021. It's time to be inclusive of all people and all beverage choices. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm glad someone pointed that out because that's true. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to have, you know, yourself limited to, you know, just beer or, you know, if you're a, a brewer, a beer brewery that's doing like predominantly IPAs. Well, some people don't like the taste of IPAs and some people don't want like, you know, beer all the time. So, you know, open yourself up to more variety and uh, you'll get a more uh, encompassed and engaged audience and customer base. Yep. That's great. And you know, would you believe it? We have three minutes left. We have been talking about oh, fermentation. It is great. Um, and I hope that, you know, some of the folks tuning in or tuning in now or later have um, not only learned about a little bit more about, and you know, non-alcoholic beer and kombucha and kefir and some of those other tasty beverages, but also that, you know, fermentation as a, you know, non-alcoholic craft beverages in general is a category that's growing. It's not going anywhere, you know, and that there's, there's innovation happening. Um, in the last three minutes, or I should say two minutes, counting down, um, is there anything, A, is there anything that we missed, and B, would, um, if folks would like to connect with y'all, the best place to do so? Yeah, so um, I think one of the questions was, where can you get yeah. uh, Golda Kombucha? Um, you can find us at all your local um, Georgia Kroger stores, as well as Whole Foods stores, variety of um, cafes, coffee shops, bars, tap rooms. Um, of course, the Cultured South Tap Room at the Lee and White Development on the West End Beltline Trail. Um, and then last but not least, you can purchase all of our products online, um, culturedsouth.com, 
is our online store. Um, you can also go to goldakombucha.com and it'll link you to our online store there. And we ship nationwide. So the beauty about having a non-alcoholic product is you can ship across state lines and we can deliver right to your doorstep. So um, check us out, culturedsouth.com, Cultured South on Instagram, Golda Kombucha on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, come visit us and drink some booch at the tap room. Awesome. Yeah, I just found you on your website, so uh, I'll be placing an order. But uh, same with athletic, athleticbrewing.com. You can get all of our beers on the website. They're not always all there because we sell out. But uh, athleticbrewing.com, we're not in every state yet, but we're working on it. You know, give us a little bit more time if we're not in your state yet. But, you know, just ask for us where you buy your beer and your spirits and your non alcoholics. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. And thank you for coming to this talk. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Nice getting yes. to meet all y'all. All you <laughs> <laughs> That'll be later. So is my official cheers. I'll be cheers in y'all in spirit. Um, so how does this work? I mean, we, we've, we've passed the hour.